My name is Yvonne Hunter. I'm the head of cultural and special events programming here at the Toronto Public Library. Tonight it is my great pleasure to welcome the multi-award winning Patrick DeWitt in conversation with the Globe and Mail's Jared Bland. Let me begin by saying that Patrick DeWitt is brilliant. And the Sisters Brothers was simply unforgettable. <laughs> The Cone brothers have nothing on Mr. DeWitt, and I wasn't the only one who thought so. The Sisters Brothers won the Governor General's Literary Award for Fiction, the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, the Stephen Leacock Medal, and was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and the Giller Prize. Patrick was born on Vancouver Island in 1975, and he lives in Portland, Oregon. I want to thank him and his publisher for coming to the library tonight. Because others have said it better than I, let me repeat some of the superlatives expressed by his fellow writers and reviewers about this new novel, Under Major Domo Minor. It has been called a controlled explosion of drollery, mischief, sly fun, and tenderness. Reading it is like coming across some twisted classic, Cervantes by way of Louis C.K. <laughs> Brutal, sly, funny, absurd, and poignant, a gripping tale, and hilariously subversive, an amusingly off-kilter vision of a European folktale, a blend of fantasy and gothic romance, a bizarre, darkly funny, passionate book. Our interviewer, Jared Bland, is the arts editor and formerly books editor of The Globe and Mail. Prior to that, he was managing editor at The Walrus and senior editor for fiction and poetry at House of Anansi Press. Originally from Springfield, Illinois, Jared studied English literature at the University of Toronto. I also want to say a few words about House of Anansi Press and The Walrus and the role both play in fostering Canadian literature. The Walrus was a sponsor of this evening's event, which is why I'm, I mention them. House of Anansi started as a small press with a mandate to publish Canadian writers, publishing authors such as Margaret Atwood, Matt Cohen, and Michael Andace, and French-Canadian works in translation from prominent names, including Roche Carrier, Marie-Claire Blay, and Anne Hebert. Today, with Sarah McLaughlin at its helm, Anansi publishes Lisa Moore, Patrick DeWitt, Lynn Cody, Rawi Hodge, Kathleen Winter, Peter Behrens, Jill Adamson, and many more, maintaining the culturally significant reputation it has built in the decades since the house was founded. House of Anansi Press does Canada proud in an era of unprecedented consolidation in the book publishing industry. This is Canadian culture, people, and it's a very fine thing. And now, um, Patrick's going to read for us, uh, so please join me in welcoming one of the most exciting voices in fiction, Patrick DeWitt. Uh, thanks. I need to set up the scene, I think. The section I'm going to read to you tonight um, involves, the protagonist's name is Lucy. And Lucy leaves home and gets a job in a remote castle. And there's a sort of proto-gypsy village ringing the base of the castle. And he becomes involved with a number of the occupants of this small town, um, one of whom is named Memel. And Memel is an elderly and infamous um, pickpocket who works the trains and steals from uh, wealthy individuals in the first class compartment. He becomes romantically involved with Clara, who is Memel's daughter, and that's who he's rushing off to visit. Where I'm, the section I'm going to read, he's just leaving work, and he's been missing Clara, and he's rushing off to meet her, and he can hardly wait. And um, he happens upon this this strange scenario. The section is called Memel's Lesson to the Children. Lucy made haste for the village, entering Clara's shanty without knocking, anticipating a glad reception, but the fire was dim in the stove, and no one was about that he could see. He heard low voices in the rear of the shanty and followed these to find a memel bedbound and wrapped in quilts, though it was not at all cold. His flesh was gray and he was obviously very ill. Clara and Mew stood at the foot of the bed, Sitting on the floor beside them were seven or eight village children, all staring up at Memel as if to receive his instruction. There was a goblet of wine in Memel's hand. He spoke evenly, placidly. One winter, he said, when I was a young child like you all, 
My father and I went to the town called Listen together to sell our cow. None of you ever laid eyes on my father, but I can tell you he was a man of honor. He had his religion, and he was well liked by all, though he did suffer from one peculiarity. It was said that he had never in his life laughed aloud. It was not that he was an unhappy man, but his existence was such that there was not any time left over for idle celebration. We couldn't afford the train, and so he walked to listen, which took three days through deep snow. We camped beside the tracks each night, throwing a blanket over the cow and sleeping underneath her to keep warm. When the trains passed, the wind whipped up in great frigid currents that would rustle the blanket and stoke our fire with sparks and embers tumbling after the caboose. I still don't know why father asked me along on this trip. I was just another thing to worry about after all, and my mother could have used my help at home. Well, I like to think he wanted me there for my company. But who can say what goes on in a man's head, eh, children? It was dusk when we arrived and listened, and Father was leading the cow by a rope while I, while I held on to its tail. Father was anxious about getting his price because whatever money we made on the sale was meant to see us through the winter. I waited outside the auction hall for him. By the time he emerged, night had fallen, and I couldn't make out his expression, and so couldn't tell how he'd fared. But then he said to me, We'll stay in town tonight. What do you think of that? And I knew he'd done even better than he'd hoped, for he meant that we would rent a room at an inn, which was unheard of for us. I told him that I liked the idea very much, and we headed off together through the crowded square, and we were very happy together, my father and I. At this point in my life, I had never ventured outside the village, and so I was amazed by what I saw and listened. The street lamps, the shop displays, the bustle of men and women, all perfectly unknown to me. I gripped my father's hand from fear of this strange world, but as the crowd pressed in on us, we were separated. I looked all around me, but couldn't place him anywhere. I saw only the bodies of strangers, and none of them had any time or concern for me. They knocked me about, pushed me out of the way, and I felt so frightened then, and had began to cry when I felt a pair of hands heft me up from behind. It was father, of course. He put me on his shoulders, patting my knee and saying, you mustn't cry, my memo. Don't you know I would never leave you on your own? You're safe with your papa, do you understand? I said that I did, and my heart swelled up with love for this man because I knew what he said was the truth. We came to an inn and after stowing our baggage in our room, repaired to the tavern downstairs. Much like the town square, this was full up so that we had to eat supper at the bar. Father pulled up a chair for me to sit on while he stood at my side, and after we ordered our supper, we took in the spectacle all about us. Father was as pleased as I had ever seen him. He had had the price of our supper folded into the bill for the room, and so was feeling very worldly and shrewd. He was drinking a beer, and he looked over the patrons as though he found them a satisfactory group. I thought I saw a trace of a smile on his face, though this may have been a trick of the candlelight. Certainly he didn't laugh, but this was the closest I had come to see him laughing. We just had our suppers placed before us when a man in a ratty coat happened past. As soon as he saw Father, he doubled back, pointing his finger, and with a perplexed look on his face. Yes, my father said. What is it, sir? The man slapped his forehead. You're going to pretend you don't know me, eh? Come here, you scoundrel. The man took up my father in the warmest embrace, lifting him clear off the ground and shaking him about. Father naturally was baffled by this, and he broke away from the stranger, who appeared hurt or insulted. But why do you push me away, my brother, he said. Has it really been so many years that you don't remember your own flesh and blood? My father explained that he had no brother, that this was a misunderstanding. At first the man could not believe it, but then father spoke further, assuring the man he had no family other than his wife and myself, his only son. A moment went by and the man shook his head. He was terribly embarrassed all at once, and he said, Of course, now I can see that you aren't my brother at all. Will you please forgive me, sir? What a fool I am, and here your supper is growing cool. He was very put out by his mistake, but father said there was nothing to be ashamed of. It was only a simple misunderstanding, 
and he wished the man luck in finding his actual brother and bade him a happy evening. The man bowed to my father and turned to take his leave of us, but before he departed, he looked at me, and in such a way that my father could not see, he winked. My father, had been eating, my father had begun eating his supper, but for my part I couldn't take my eyes off this man, and I watched him go. It seemed to me that, for one who had only seconds earlier been begging forgiveness, there was a curious lightness to his step. He actually leapt over the threshold at the entrance before vanishing into the crowd outside. And what do you make of that, my father asked me, slurping up his stew. I said that I didn't know what, but that the man had been a strange one. Father agreed, and now we ate our supper before returning to our room where we eased into the soft feather bed. The sound of celebration coming up from the streets carried on into the night, and as I drifted off, I felt closer to my father than ever before. We were, the pair of us, a portrait of pride and contentment. All this went awry in the morning, however, for when it came time to settle our bill, we were greeted with a cruel fact, which was that my father's purse was missing. We searched our room and retraced our steps from the day before, but this came to nothing, and finally we had to admit that the money was gone. It dawned on my father that the man in the tavern who had embraced him had been a charlatan, a pickpocket. When he explained this to me, I recalled the carefree manner in which the man had skipped over the threshold. Likely he knew by the weight of my father's purse that he had happened upon a significant payday, and he was eager to begin his spending. And while I was on the one hand sorry for my father and fearful for us as a family, so too did I feel a curious kinship or sympathy with the thief. Now the question has come up in my mind oftentimes over the years, just where did this sympathy come from? My mother and father never so much as told a lie, and I had been raised to believe that the more you toiled, then the purer you became, and so were well poised to receive God's favor when you passed into his kingdom. I had no reason to doubt my parents, both of them being good, kind people. Be that as it may, from the moment I saw that scallywag making away with my father's money, I was transformed. Memel took a sip of wine from his goblet, seemingly chewing it before welcoming it into his stomach. He took a second sip and made a sound like ah or ha. He said, it was not just the fact of the man's thieving that was attractive to me. It was also the way the thieving apparently made him feel. How I longed to cross a threshold in just the same manner as he. I couldn't get him out of my mind and began to live my life in such a way that my following after him became an inevitability. And so it went, children. I devoted my every energy to play, to shirking, to laughing, to non-working. I ran from every type of responsibility presented to me, be it chores or schoolwork or what have you. My mother and father battled valiantly against my rebellion, but I would not be discouraged and soon embarked on my own career as a pickpocket, and a deservedly storied career it has been, if you don't mind my saying. All through my apprenticeship and my eventual mastery of the art of thieving, you may be interested to learn I never for a moment misplaced my religion. In actuality, I became more devout all the while, though my God was not the God of my elders. For it had always been unattractive to me that he should reward his servants for drudge work. Indeed, that he should desire servants in the first place. Being dissatisfied with their God, then I created a God of my own. And mine was not one to honor labor, but one who repaid the bold. The farmer, upon seeing a healthy crop in his fields, kneels and gives his thanks. A shopkeeper will gaze with gratitude at the profits recorded in his ledger. For my part, when I came, to, when I came upon a wealthy merchant passed out in his first-class compartment, this was the instant I was paused to reflect, to praise my Savior. It was he who had guided me to these fruitful pastures these half-men crying out to be robbed. God wished them taught a lesson, and I, brave Memel, was his instrument. He looked away from the children into a spot high in the wall. Even now, he said, when I dream, I dream of a compartment filled with the slumbering bodies of wealthy men. I am a younger version of myself, and my energy knows no limits, and I am afraid of nothing in the world. I strip them of their possessions, and their red faces are so peaceful and glad as they sleep, for they themselves are dreaming of a full table, let's say, 
a banquet held in their honor, and their hands grasping at this and that. My daughter Clara has spoken over the years of a time of reckoning for me, a day when I would feel my feet in the flames, at which point I would repent and beg forgiveness. But it would seem this time is approaching now, and I can say it truthfully, I was right, and my mother and father were wrong. I loved them both, but they were fools. There is nothing noble in suffering, nothing worthwhile in mindless labors. And if you see something you want, children, you should take it, because the fact of your wanting it renders it yours. Memo closed his eyes. That's all I wanted to say to you, he said. Thank you for listening to me. The children left the room in a peaceable and orderly fashion. Thank you. I love Memel's completely full-throated endorsement of crime. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was, when I was reading it, I was, I, I, I was looking at my pages in my copy, and it's just marked to death, the things I wanted to ask you about that very section, so I'm, yeah. I'm delighted that you read it. It harkens back to an earlier moment in the book when this man named Older Glau, who is the major domo under whom Lucy Minor serves, says something to the effect of, a touch of criminality thickens the blood. Yeah. So you, 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 like, is this career advice for us? I don't know. I don't know where that's coming from, really. Um, I, think, I think that Memo's words resonate with me on some base level. Um, <laughs> but it's not, I'm not trying to teach anyone anything they don't know already. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see a connection between how you characterize that kind of um, alluring criminality and the sort of creative act you're undergoing in making that story? I don't know, you know, I think of, of scenes like the one I just read or the older glow scene you're referencing and so much of it is just um, composed under the influence of instinct and it's not intellectual, it's not an intellectual endeavor for me. Art making is very much by the gut. So what, what I'm trying to say oftentimes won't reveal itself to me necessarily ever or it will reveal itself to me much later. And typically this is through the reactions of the readers or reviewers, but more, mostly the readers, I find. What, is, what have you learned talking to readers about this book? Um, I, well, I'm thinking more of my body of work than, than just this one book, but um, there's redundancies in my work that I wasn't really necessarily aware of. Um, I seem to continue to focus on people that are unhappy or dissatisfied <laughs> in, their, in, their, in their work, you know, yeah. and they want something more for themselves. Um, but isn't that I, kind of like all fiction? Like, can you imagine a novel that's just like about a happy person? Of course, no, no, yeah. It'd be yeah. very boring. It would be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, compromised individuals are far more interesting than well-adjusted, uh, you know. It would be a short book, I think. Yeah, <laughs> but you said this amazing thing in an interview a couple of months ago about this book where you're like, I can imagine nothing more boring than a confident man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is a good kind of motto. Um, yeah. and, and that was in relation to the book you've been trying to write before this, which didn't quite pan out. Yeah, and I think that was the problem. I was writing a book about somebody who was very much an alpha male um, investment advisor, like a Bernie Madoff type of a yeah. person. And I thought it would be fascinating to approached an individual like this, and it just wound up being um, dead boring for me. And I think, that, I think that the problem was that I was dealing with somebody who wasn't open to anything, really, somebody who knew everything already, or thought he did. Mm. Um, and that is, that's a, that's a, it's a very limiting jumping off point. But would it not be compelling to explore the undoing of someone who thought they knew everything? But then you're dealing in, a, in from, you're working from a point of revenge, which is un, uninteresting. Like cruel from the start. Yeah, I'm trying to, I, this is when I, when I say teach anyone a lesson, I, I don't want to teach my characters a lesson necessarily, or certainly not my protagonist, maybe. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's nothing, I, I came around to the idea that I actually don't have anything to say about Bernie Madoff. I have nothing to say <laughs> about him. He exists, there will always be people like that, there has always been people uh, in possession of that personality, and that's fine. It's just part of the landscape of humanity. But I don't find it particularly interesting. Well, tell us about Lucien Minor, for those of you who haven't read the book, to just kind of get caught up. Yeah. How, why is he interesting to you? And tell us how you kind of invented him. Well, conversely, he's just, you know, 17 years old, and, and at 17 I was a mess. 
And he is similarly, I think, he's a little bit more, I think, self, self-possessed than I was, but, you know, he's a compromised person. He's, he, he, he's um, quick to lie. He's, he's, he's hasn't really found his place in the world yet. He um, isn't liked by his peers in the village that he's grown up in. His mother doesn't care for him particularly. <laughs> That's and, how the book begins, if you haven't read it. It's yeah. basically like his mother telling him, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> So that's just, you know, as a, as, as, a, as a starting point, that's more interesting to me. Um, but, you know, even I'm thinking of confident men specifically, um, I just don't like to, I don't like them, you know? <laughs> and there's, there's confidence and there's, I don't mean I surround myself with self-doubting losers, <laughs> but, you know, people that feel they, people that are incurious, people that mm-hmm. think they know everything or yeah. pretend that they know everything. This is just the dullest thing in the world to me. So. Well, and there's like, you know, there are people who are confident but still like full of crippling self-doubt and like yeah. make their way through the world. Sure, More yeah. interesting. Yeah. You talked a bit about your friends. You did this wonderful interview with my colleague at the Globe, Mark Medley, and you talked about your friends as being this kind of fractured group of um, pained people. You said this and then I heard from this group of did friends. Did you guys say? That's yeah. my question. <laughs> I say these things and I don't really think them through. And well, you know, it's in a newspaper, and then my friends call me and say, "So we're all just complete misfit toys." So yeah. Thanks for, thanks for humoring us with, uh, you know, your presence. And <laughs> so I have to be more careful. When we were doing that piece, though, a copy editor came over to me and she was like, "Wow, I really admire that Patrick Dewitt." And I was like, "What do you mean?" She's like, "He's just so honest about his friends in that piece." Yeah, too honest. <laughs> so I, I, I should have told you. I, well, uh, no, I have a friend, my friend Azazel, who is a good pal of mine, read that, and he called me, and he says, do you, is there anything you want to say to me? And I didn't know what he was talking about. And um, I never really read the interviews after they're out, because I always just, it makes me cringe to hear my, you know, and I'd forgotten I'd said it. And then um, he, he took me to task. He was, he, was, he was a little bit pissed off at me, actually. You couldn't but, be like, oh, no, I meant the rest of them. You're well, fine. I sort of did. I, I wasn't thinking <laughs> of you specifically, but, you know. I talk to him every day on the phone. He's one of my closest friends. And <laughs> yeah, you gotta be careful what you say. I thought it was just kind of wonderful though because it was the sort of well of humanity from which you draw all of this work. And I think that's why a book like The Sisters Brothers in particular, you talk about not wanting to write about confident people, like those incredible kind of dual heroes of that book who are kind of the most humane, flawed in a perfectly beautiful, true way characters in Canadian literature that I can remember from like the last 20 years or something. Gosh. Do Thanks. people people connect to those two and talk to you about that? People yes, have an obsession with that book. Especially the character of Eli. Yeah. I get a lot of um I meet a lot of people who, who related to him in some way. And it's really gratifying. You know. Um but it's mysterious though. It's mysterious to me why that worked why that worked out that way. And this is somebody who You know, you talk about compromised individuals. It's like he's, you know, he's a he's a he's a he's a hitman who kills people for a living, mm-hmm. um, and he has access to a rage in his heart that abets this and enables him to do this without thinking it, about it very often. You know, he's a tortured individual, um, and so it's strange when you meet someone and they tell you how much they related to this character, and it's like you're in an, you're in an airport, and it's like, oh, you like that guy, okay? <laughs> but of course, I I like him too. Um, it's, 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 it's a very sweet moment, actually, when, 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 when I'm approached um, regarding that book. What are the things that Lucy has within him that he draws on? Like you say, Eli draws on this rage. Yeah. What is within Lucy that he has in reserve? Well, I think he's a bit of a... Um, it's a good question. I don't know if he has that one thing, but I, I, I mean, he definitely... Um, isn't averse to, tw- to twisting facts to... to <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> to, his, yeah. to, his, to his benefit. Um, I think what Lucy has, Lucy's sort of guiding force in, in, in this book is that he's, um, he's ready to receive love. And he hasn't received it. You know, so it's sort of like... Um, he feels emotionally equipped to love and be loved, ideally by a woman, Clara, <laughs> someone, you know, yeah. an attractive woman. This is what he's hopeful for. He's very, he's deeply romantic. And he has probably unfair expectations of what love will be, I feel. Which is very common, I think, in, in, in adolescence, in post-adolescence. And I was certainly that way, and maybe I still am to a degree. Um, but it delivers for him in this book. And so for me, anyway, writing those scenes where he was receiving love from somebody who he felt 
that he loved as well. It was really gratifying, you know, and it felt it's a happy moment to, to, to flesh those scenes out. To just have it be requited and yeah. satisfying. And yeah, yeah. It also, of course, the thing that moved me so much in the book um, is that it touches on all sorts of different kinds of love. Like, there's this incredible mentorship love between um, the staff of the house, in particular the major domo and Agnes, the cook, yeah. and Lucy, which I was, I, I'm always amazed at your ability to write these relationships between men, um, in Sisters Brothers, of course, obviously, and in this book, between Olderglau and, uh, and Lucy, it's just so incredibly touching and intricate and connected and kind of patterned and beautiful. I mean, what is that sort of friendship exploration? I mean, is that is satisfying in a similar way, or is it a...? Yeah. I, the thing with Older Glow and Lucy that came out really quickly, um, it became clear that they were going to have a lot to say to each other, and that... Should we wait for the phone to stop? <laughs> <laughs> she, she um, you know, as soon as... Older Glow was meant to be a very minor character in the book. He's supposed to just be this sort of decrepit scarecrow who let people in and out of the castle. <laughs> and then the second, the first scene was written with him receiving Lucy, he just was such a chatty guy. And then there was this really natural um, relationship. <clears throat> I mean, Lucy need, needs some sort of, not necessarily a father figure, but maybe a mentor type yeah. figure. And Older Glow is just a shoe in for that position. I mean, he's a terribly inept mentor. And he himself is riddled with self-doubt. And all he does is opine about what things that have not happened in his own life. Or how and things yet, used to be a little yeah, bit. Yeah, how things used know? to be. And yet there was some instant tenderness between these two characters. And so it's just a question of cultivating that and seeing it through and, and, and trying to maximize it without overdoing it. I definitely overwrote those scenes and then had to pare back quite a lot. Yeah. Because they could have gone on and on, these two, for a long while. Um, but so much of writing is just happy accidents, you know. And it's never, nothing ever really goes as I want it to go necessarily or as, as per plan. And my plans are usually pretty murky at best. But um, it was just one of those things. It's like, okay, you've, you, 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 you hit a vein yeah, maybe with it these says, two characters and then you just follow it through. It might say more about the deficiencies in my life that I found that romance between the two of them like actually much more compelling and satisfying than the, the kind of you know, classical romantic relationship. Yeah, well, yeah, it's different kinds of things, but it's, it's really like when I say Lucy was open to receiving love, I think yeah. that by the end of the book, I think that Older Glow sort of basically admits that he, he cares for, for Lucy um, in an almost familial way, and, then it's, it's, and that's definitely, I feel, requited, but that's quite ultimately a tragic story. It doesn't necessarily end well for Older Glow, but... Mm -hmm. um, the, at the outset with this book, I, th I had it in my mind that it was going to be a very traditional love story between Lucy and Clara. And what wound up happening was there's all, all these different variations of love as we know it that began to pop up. Um, there's the Baron and Baroness, which is a story of unrequited <laughs> love and is quite dire. And, and um, it's much more like a cautionary tale as opposed to the, the, the traditional love story of Lucy and Clara. And then there's Lucy's um, affection for Memel. Um, and then there's a degree of love in the very large hole between these three sort of wayward souls. You know... You haven't read the book that sounds like a sorry, really random yeah. sentence. <laughs> there's a large hole in the book. Very large hole. <laughs> Lucy falls into this large hole. But um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think I'd gone into it meaning to represent one type of love, but then I, I, I found that the other ones were as compelling to, to address. And I think desired almost equal um, stage time, you know? Yeah, I was brought to tears several times by it, which I often am. I mean, it's like, I don't mean it as a crier. Yeah, I'm a crier. Yeah. Yeah. You know this about me, I think. And uh, there's this amazing moment <laughs> where <laughs> there, Memel and Clara are teasing Lucy, and he gets really upset and he leaves. And then several days later, his hat, which has been stolen, I think, if I remember correctly, is returned to him and tucked in the bill of it is a note that says, we were teasing you because we liked you. Yeah. And it's just like the idea of a person who had never experienced at age 17, yeah. that dynamic, I found yeah. heartbreaking. Yeah. Not much to say about that. No. It's more of an observation. No. <laughs> okay, I have one thing I wanted to ask you about, which is this, um, there's a wonderful moment where Lucy looks in a mirror and he is unable, quote, unable to reconcile the connection between his reflection and his mind. <laughs> Tell us more about that. Um. Well, that's certainly, I'm laughing because that's definitely something that I had a problem with. 
um, around the age of 17, 18, through basically my mid-20s, I had this phenomenon, and I, and I should go to a psychiatrist or psychologist and find out. I mean, there's probably a name for it, I suspect. It's very common. anyone knows, call it it's out. probably yeah. very common. But I felt increasingly, um, when I would look at my reflection in the mirror, that there was me, and that was my, my thoughts and my, you know, and then there was this person in the mirror, and that these people were dis not connected. And there was also all these strange symptoms. Um, I remember I would drive a car, and oftentimes I would feel that my right hand was on my left hand, and my left hand was on my right hand. Does that make sense? Do you, know, do you understand what I'm saying? They're laughing like they know exactly That's what okay. you're talking about. <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, well, you can tell me after. Um, anyway, what I'm saying is there was all these, I had these bizarre physical symptoms combined with this thing of not really recognizing the person in the mirror, and not just not recognizing him, but feeling a hostility mm -hmm. towards the person in the mirror. And this went away, mercifully, around 25 or 26 or so. But um, I remember it very vividly. It was unpleasant. And um, it's just one of those things where you take a detail from your life and mm -hmm. slip it into a book. You know? But it seemed to me almost like an objective for Lucy to find a way to like whether it's through, I don't know, some sort of self-awareness or something, but to kind of merge these two things until he does find that sort of well, he's peace. Not, well, he's not rooted in the beginning of the book. And at the yeah. end of the book, he is, he, he is living within his body in a way that he wasn't before. You know, he's not just, his body's not just the sort of vessel that he has to use the way you drive a car, which is how I remember I always thought of my body as like a used car <laughs> as opposed to a new car. <laughs> Like that, I Did you upgrade thinking, eventually? I, well, I, I just sort of, yeah, I washed the car. And, <laughs> Some detailing done? Did, yeah. And, um, no, you just accept that this is your car. This is my car. Great. Um, but I was against my car for a long time. <laughs> okay, there's another moment where something looks in a mirror, and it's this... The, oh, I just get, Indulge me if I explain this quickly. So the Major Domo has this bird, a minor bird, which made me, always makes me think of Twin Peaks, the minor birds. And anyway... The minor bird doesn't sing, is never sung, and he's like crushed by this. He's so disappointed. He got the bird to sing, yeah. and Lucy is like, aha moment, I'm going to put a mirror in front of the bird, yeah. and the bird starts to sing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's very um, heavy-handed scene, if you think about it. <laughs> but it works. That's why I'm asking. Like, to me, at least for, for me as one reader, it kind of ricocheted off the It worked for, it worked for me, moments. but it's one of those things where it's like, that's where you're going to go for that? Then, you know, the bird <laughs> is no longer alone, and now he sings. And, but that's, you know, I went for it. You know, I think that the fable, <laughs> the fable uh, backdrop lends itself to excessive writing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I really like that. These sort and of I like the cliche. I, I'm a big fan of cliche. <laughs> and I, I just, it's really nice to engage in it from time to time, you know? Um, as long as it's, you know, measured out with other elements that are maybe a little bit left to center. But for me, it works. I find it, I find it kind of wonderfully undermining uh, of cliche in a way because it just makes the bird to seem like a stupid narcissist. <laughs> it's like not another real bird, yeah. but he buys it, you know, right. <laughs> and dives happily in. Well, tell us about this fable background. Um, some of you might have read about this already, but this book has a kind of very pronounced root in books you were reading in France with your son. Yeah, well, I just had a couple of um, compendiums of... Um, I had a, I, it was a Central Eastern European fable, you know, compendium, and then there was a, a compendium of Jewish fables. And I was just sort of running through them with my kid, and I was in Paris review, uh, researching this book that we were just saying I lost, the, the banker book. Um, and in reading these stories to my kid, I was feeling that way writers sometimes feel, which is so, sort of a, a, like an overt envy or jealousy, mm -hmm. the people that were telling these stories had clearly had a really good time composing these stories. And I was not having fun working on my, so I was feeling sort of, <laughs> and then I just drew the conclusion of, well, anyway, I thought, well, if I lost this other book, and it was becoming increasingly clear that the book had to go, what would be there to take its place? I didn't want to just go from that to nothing. I think it's better to work on something if just to stay in shape as opposed to just going, you know, as opposed Go, to just going to the dressing of void. Yeah. So I began to think of maybe the fable as a possibility, you know, just as a starting point. And so it was a question of just reading these stories more for myself, not so much for my kid anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he soldiered through while you <laughs> amused yourself? He was fine, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I began to read them. I, I stopped reading them as a parent, and I began to read them as a writer. Mm -hmm and sort of just um, dissecting the language, um, the, the authorial tone, you know? And that's all really fun, 
getting the voice yeah. straight. That's like the fun stuff at the beginning. And um, yeah, I just I dumped the other one and went this other route. What was your best memo pickpocketing moment from one of those fables? What did you just pick right up and put down? Well, it just seems like there's a cast of characters in most of these fables, and there's usually a thief in there somewhere. Yeah. So I can't recall a specific memo inspired or one a scene that inspired uh, any of the memo stuff, but... Oh, no, I mean, you're, you're, you're acting as memo. Like, what did you outright oh, steal? Oh, I see. Well, I mean, the basic beginning is so <laughs> clearly. It's a young boy leaving home for the big wide world. It's like this is the most overwritten beginning to any <laughs> book, you know, that... Um, there's any number of, I think, very familiar moments in this book. Yeah. But it's sort of like familiar, unfamiliar, familiar, unfamiliar. And the unfamiliar is where things become ten, tend to become more personal, you know, writing more from my heart. And then the other stuff is um, addressing the form and um, addressing the influences. And um, we were chatting briefly about the acknowledgments page. I began to recognize as soon as I was working on this book that I wasn't writing a traditional fable. I was writing in, a, in the vein of, of a contemporary author, a relatively contemporary author, addressing the traditional storyline of the fable or fairy tale. And so the, the list, there's a list of authors in the back of the book that I feel have done that very well. And these are people that I looked to throughout the, the writing of this book. So I gave them a hat off at the end of the book. <laughs> I saw you um, at an event in Kingston a couple weeks ago, yeah. and you were talking about that list. And it, you made it sound as though you also sort of wrote that because when you wrote The Sisters Brothers, you got really tired of people saying, oh, you must have been so inspired by Cormac McCarthy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, so... So there's a couple different reasons. One is that I really used or leaned on these authors in a way that I don't typically when I'm writing. And so I felt a almost moral obligation to just say to the world, these are the people that have helped me along with this project. Um, but then also, you know, these are all authors that I came to the hard way. And by that I mean to say that nobody, I found them all on my own and having never gone to college and things like that my syllabus has been really erratic mm -hmm. and it took me many years to find the authors that were writing for me specifically i.e. the people on this list um, so I thought maybe it would, I would do a good turn I wish I, I'd been giving this list in total when I was 20 save you some time it would have saved me a lot of time but it would have also just really I think clarified my intentions if anybody's looking for a reading list it is like a truly exceptional list so, so yeah but then also there's this thing of People assign you influences when you do something publicly. People say, well, clearly you're influenced by such and such. And I found that when people do that with me, they're, they're um, oftentimes incorrect. <laughs> and it's not so much that I, I have nothing against Cormac McCarthy or whomever else I've been um, told I'm working in a similar vein of. Um, but I wanted to avoid that, and I found that this is a, absolutely a fool's errand because everybody absolutely ignores this list of authors. I have say specifically, this is the stuff that influenced me, and nobody brings it up. Well, the problem is you wrote that list late, and so it's not in the advanced copies true, that all yeah. the journalists got, yeah, yeah. and it's in the finish. I, I had to photograph yours. So now they're sending me influences that aren't on the list, and it's sort of like, so I've th I throw up my hands. What's what the, there must be one that really drives you nuts when you're like, no, no, no. I, I. Well, you know what happened? I, I, I think um, there's, there's, a, there's an... At a three, about three quarters through the writing of this book, I became aware of a Wes Anderson film called The Grand Budapest Hotel. Uh huh. I'm familiar and with I, that. And film. I saw an ad for it, and I just thought, ah, <laughs> oh, fuck, you know. <laughs> and I went and saw it in Portland, Oregon, and I, I, it put me at ease actually right away. I, I, I think that Wes Anderson's great, but there, there are uncanny story similarities there. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I think the intent is different, and, I, and after about 20 minutes, I relaxed, and I just could enjoy the movie. But I also knew at the end of the movie, I said, well, this is going to be the new Cormac McCarthy. And it absolutely, <laughs> absolutely is. Everybody just says, well, this is great. It's just like Wes Anderson. And it's like, OK. I well, never would have thought of that comparison in a million well, years. Well, <laughs> again, I don't, that's not, it's not uh, anything against Cormac McCarthy, or I mean, uh, Wes Anderson. <laughs> Wes Anderson, but, it's you Cormac know. McCarthy's finest film, though. Yeah, I think yeah, we'd yeah. all have to yeah. agree. No, but I know what you mean. But what you're, you're it's frustrating. Like, it's frustrating. Yeah. Because, because I do feel the intention is, is different. And you know. Um, I just don't, I don't agree with the, the, the comparison. But yeah. I, I'm sympathetic to people making it but, um, because there are similarities. But to me, the, the, the links are, are separate. You know? Yeah, it's just like there's a house on a hill and like a, you know, a kind of major domo type thing. That's it. 
Well, it, the, the, it really ends there. But the, somebody gets their fingers cut off, which happens in this book. And I remember when I saw that, I was just like, <laughs> really? You're going to cut off fingers? You know? Um, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. Well, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, on that list of influences, it's, it's, as I say, it's amazing. There um, are two people I wanted to ask you about what you, what you took from them. Robert Coover and Roald Dahl, who, oh, yeah. who are kind of like on different ends of a certain spectrum. They are and they aren't. Roald Dahl did a lot of, obviously, children's books that he's very famous for, James and Giant Peach and, and Charlie and Chocolate Factory, but he also wrote for adults. Um, and it's sort of in a similar vein. It just, essentially, um, the children's stuff is really perverse and dark and violent, but yeah. there's no sex. And with the adult <laughs> stuff, it's perverse and dark and violent, and there is sex. <laughs> and he wrote a collection of stories called Switch Bitch, which is amazing really great. And he's just a master, I think, and he works in this very traditional mode, um, and I think that he's, it's almost like in the tradition of oral storytelling, you, you really get a sense of, he's just a gifted spinner of yarns, you know, but he's also um, a masterful craftsman. And he wore his intelligence really lightly, which I appreciated in an author, he didn't lord it over you. Um, so that was neat. He was accessible in a way that Accessible is a weird word. He's approachable. Mm -hmm. Anybody can read Roald Dahl and um, theoretically get something out of it if you possess that sense of humor that you need to, you know. Um, I just, he's one of those people who I, I, I felt like he had accomplished what I was hoping to accomplish. Mm -hmm. With Coover, um, I was thinking of um, a book of his called Prick Songs and Descans, mm -hmm. which he does a bit of the traditional storytelling fable yeah. type stuff. But he does it in this, you know, it's like a fable told by a genius, basically. You yeah. Know? So, um, Coover's just a wizard. Have you ever read the Universal Baseball Association? Yeah. It's the greatest baseball novel ever written. Yeah. Since it's the playoffs, I can plug it. Yeah. Robert Coover's the Universal Baseball Association, comma, J. Henry Waugh proprietor. Right. Yeah. Just a knockout. Yeah. Um, we are almost uh, on time for audience questions here, but I just want to ask you one thing. I was really struck by something you said in an interview um, with the National Post where you said that more and more you're interested in real human emotions, which I kind of loved for someone on their third novel to be like, you know, I think I'm now going to turn to the real human stuff. <laughs> what, yeah, what, 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 were you, what were you up to before? Yeah, I don't know. It's such a weird <laughs> thing to say. I was addressing phony human emotions before. <laughs> I don't know. It's very common for me to, uh, for a quote to come back to me, and I, I yeah. just sort of, this, I don't is, why I, this is why I don't read my interviews. Yeah. Because I'll look at it and it's like, what does that mean? What am I even saying? I don't know, you know? You do the best you can do in these situations. And sometimes, sometimes the truth is dispensed, and then sometimes it's just like gobbledygook. But what are you interested in now that you didn't used to be interested in, like when you're writing your first book? I, think that, I, was, I think that I was maybe referring to the fact of this, this book being a love story, and um, at the age of 40, approaching sincerity. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, sincerity is very dangerous. You know what I'm saying? Because it's, it's very easy to bleed in, so from sincerity to bleed into um, the maudlin or the... Sincerity is difficult to approach as a writer, I find. Um, wearing your heart on your sleeve is dangerous. Um, but I, at the age of 40, it's, I feel like it's time for me to address what's actually going on in my mind and my heart in a way that I'm not hiding behind anything in the way that so many people do and that I've done in the past, hiding behind irony is sort of the, mm -hmm. if we could do away with one thing, I think that irony would probably be the one thing that I would put on the chopping block first because it's totally counterproductive and um, I think it's cowardly and I've had enough of it. So what I'm saying is I'm looking to address how I actually feel in a way that's not too heavy-handed, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, I'm, it's very challenging for me. It's hard to do it. Because irony is the go-to for our generation. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to slip into it and to dismiss everything and to, and to pretend that nothing matters. But that's not going to see me through an entire lifetime, that attitude. So I'm, I need to make a shift. I think you, that's what I was trying to say. Is, you said it better right Sounds now. Better this yeah, time, it was yeah. much better. Yeah. <laughs> Practiced up. Yeah. Do you feel that, you know, I'm, it's, I'm, it's in a way surprising to hear you say that because I think of The Sisters Brothers as being such a, an intensely sincere book. I suppose um, so. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel that you've created something more sincere than in, in the past with this new novel? Maybe just in my, my addressing love, which is something that I've yeah. wanted to do for a long time. 
um, but I didn't feel that I necessarily had the tools to do it or wasn't, I didn't feel up for it necessarily. I think of the Sisters Brothers as like a great love story too though. Yeah, but I have but, a problematic relationship with my brother. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I was definitely, I was definitely in, in writing that book, I was definitely addressing um, real family emotion. Mm -hmm. um, I have two brothers and I love them both very much. So, you know, it's something that was, I felt very engaged in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, I, I suppose I was just referencing the, 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 the appearance of the love story, the, you know, the traditional mutual love tale with this book. Well, before we take questions, um, I just have to say that I've known Patrick for years and read uh, all, well, not there are three books. It's not like all that many books, but. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of a I've, lot. It's not that bad. This is, you, you've done very, very well. Right? <laughs> but I, I just don't mean to praise my own reading. But I just want to say this book destroyed me. It is an incredible, beautiful, haunting thing. And if you have not read it, you must buy it or check it out from the library and read it. And I think you will all really love it. Um, and so now it's just my endorsement phase. So uh, let's take questions from the audience. There's a <laughs> microphone in the middle there you can make your way toward. <clears throat> it's going to be an awkward standoff. There we go. Thank you. At the beginning of the book, Lucy says he's hoping for something to happen. And over the course of the book, like, there's the, the very large hole in the, the, uh, the ballroom scene. And I'm just wondering, what is something that happened that maybe didn't make into the book that was edited out for any reason either you or someone else said, maybe this doesn't need to happen? Yeah. <laughs> um, good question. There was a, initially in the writing of this book, there, so the, his love interest is young as he is, but in, in the original draft of the book, Clara, the love interest, was nine months pregnant when he met her. And um, this was, everything was going fine until that's, that emerged, that she was pregnant. And I started skipping over and writing scenes that I knew would happen after the fact, but there's this whole sort of center of the book <coughs> whereby... Clara had a baby, Lucy had a relationship with the baby, the baby sort of grew up. All this time was passing. I needed him to have an actual verbal relationship with his child. So the idea was that he was going to be at the, the, the castle for years as opposed to months. Um, it was just this, I didn't recognize that it was the primary problem with the book, but I eventually diagnosed that this was what was wrong. Um, I did something that I'd never done before, which is that I mapped out each scene on three by five cards. So it's a scene one, Lucy leaves home. Scene two, Lucy catches the train to blah, blah, blah. And I did every scene, you know, that I had. And there's a lot of question marks and holes and everything like that. So I could, because I couldn't, it's quite a busy story. And there's a lot of characters and I, I couldn't focus. And I wasn't thinking of it as a piece. I was seeing it more as sections sort of gaseously floating around in my mind. So in making this poster, in front of my desk with all the three by five cards on it, I could see the book as a whole. And it took a period of maybe two days of sort of staring at it for quite a long period of time before it emerged as a whole. But I could see it now all of a sudden as a single piece of work and I could see what was wrong. And what was wrong was that Clara was nine months pregnant. Having a, embarking on a love story with somebody who's nine months pregnant is a tall order. You know? <laughs> and so all of a sudden I thought, but wait, what if, Claire is not nine months pregnant. And I took, I, in doing that, I got to take away five or six cards that were just all these question marks and what happens next and Jesus and um, completely simplified everything so much. And that was like the big breakthrough of the book. Claire is not pregnant. Because they've got enough going against them. It's hard enough for them without her having a baby and everything like this. So that was the one big one, I think, that, that, I, that, I, that I cut out. Thanks. Sure. I love that Lucy's goal is to have something happen. And then it, toward the end of the book, he reflects at one point, he's like, what an eventful day I am yeah. having. <laughs> it is a wonderfully satisfying yeah. moment for him. Yeah, thanks. Um, you kind of already spoke about this in your last answer, but I was wondering if you could talk about your writing process, um, either on a micro or a macro level. Uh, <coughs> are you surprised with how the novels unfold? Um, or when you set out to write each day, know where you want to be? I usually know that I want to get maybe 500 words down. But that's the extent of it. And I don't know typically what the 500 words will be. Um, I'm happiest, I think, when I know, when I'm maybe partway through a scene or I know what's going to happen. So I'm sitting down and I know 
what will happen that day. But I tend not to really think beyond the day. And that's not just in my work. I think that's how I am generally. <laughs> like I tend to be very focused on the present and maybe the immediate future, but anything further than a week or two away, and I have a really hard time comprehending what that will look like or be like or what I even want it to be. I work for a couple hours in the day and then for an hour or two at night. Um, fairly diligently, like if I'm on a novel, it'll usually be six or even seven days a week. But the hours are fairly brief, a couple hours in the morning and then one or two at night. It's not that much. So it leaves me a lot of time to sort of regenerate, which I think I used to burn myself out a bit. And you always hear these stories. Authors like to say that they write for 10 hours a day, and I've decided that they're lying. <laughs> I don't, and it, partly I want them to be lying because I can't do that. <laughs> But I also just, I can't, it's, it's incomprehensible to me because it's a very, you know, limited well that you're, that you're pulling from and it needs time to, to regenerate and um, I've learned not to push myself and I don't. You know. but, <laughs> but I find that it's important to do it every day as much as you can, six days a week, say. And then it's, because what happens is it becomes embedded in you in a way, you know, once it's really in your blood, a, a project that you're working on or a short or whatever it is, um, you're, you are kind of working all the time, As, you know, and then reading becomes an extension of your writing, so I'll stop writing and then I'll sit down to read, and I'm still working in some way because I'm still, that part of my brain is still operating, and it's very common for me to put the book down and have it jot down a note, or, you know, it's all, it's always sort of percolating, I guess, is what I'm saying which is a really nice, it's almost like having imaginary friends. It's really satisfying an alternate life outside of your actual life. And I'm happiest when I'm involved in a project in this way, that it's moving along under its own steam. You know? That was a long answer. Thank you. Short question. Next. Hi. I was just wondering, as a child, were you a storyteller? And if so, did you tell exaggerations of <laughs> real stories, or did you make them entirely up? <laughs> I really like that question. I, I, was a, I, I would tell exaggerated versions of what had really happened. I remember getting caught on some pretty silly lies as a child, and that was not the best feeling. And so I found it best to work off of something that had actually occurred, but then tweaking it <laughs> to make, make it better, you know, so, yeah, which is what, the same thing I'm doing now. Yeah, we, didn't even, we didn't even get to talk about what a glorious liar Lucy is. It's, yeah. Yeah. My fault. Thank you. Behind you. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm glad you brought up Wes Anderson, because I think one of the things that sort of characterizes him is the idea of him being an auteur, that you know, there is a Wes Anderson style. And I think that the, the, there was a New York Times uh, review of, of the book here that sort of referenced the, the Patrick DeWitt style. Mm. And I think, for me, there's, there are sentences that will jump off of sort of every page that uh, I'm sort of wondering how they, they arrive. You know, with Sisters Brothers, there was, you know, he had a head that invited violence. And with this one, he had no time to be happy in the course of a day. So I'm wondering how those... Uh, is that something that sort of comes out naturally, or is that an, an editing process that sort of comes back to that? Or, because it's a very distinctive, you know, there is a Patrick DeWitt book. And yeah. I don't know. I think it's something that I've arrived at without any great considerations. I think that it's probably um, partly based on influence and partly based on where my mind just wants to go. Um, it keeps coming back to me in the last couple of weeks I've been turning around talking about it, and I'm just recognizing that writing is really, I think, mentally unhealthy. To, you spend so much time alone, <laughs> you know, and people are saying, where did this scene come from? And it's sort of, I think it's stemming from spending too much time alone, you know? <laughs> and this is what I do with my time when I'm alone. I don't know, I'm, I'm not, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but <laughs> I don't know where it comes from. Like, it's the great mystery, and I think that if I knew, it could probably upset the process in some way. And I think it's one of those things best not to wonder why. Just pray that it keeps on coming, you know? 
There's this kind of wonderful aspirational melancholy in that book, though, in the new book. There's a moment where Lucy gets jealous because someone else is more heartsick than he is. And then there's this other amazing moment where he thinks about how sweet the pain of his head injury is, the kind of sweet sadness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, next question. Yeah, I was just wondering, are there any like specific tools or lessons that you learned from this project or even the Bernie Madoff project that you abandoned? Because <coughs> there's the, the end product and there's all the things you learn producing that end product which are in yeah. a, of themselves useful, even if the thing itself is a failure, not that the Bernie <coughs> project was, but... Yeah, I don't really feel bad when I, I... I mean, in the moment when I lost the Bernie Madoff book, I was upset and I felt like I'd wasted time. But you have to recognize that you weren't wasting time because I think that at the end of the, at the beginning of that book and then at the end of that book when I abandoned it, I'd been working every day and very diligently. And I suspect that I improved as a writer in that period of time. So even though there's no evidence of it necessarily, right. in, insofar as that book is gone and will never be seen, I was working every day. And I was, even though I wasn't necessarily connecting with the work 100% every day, um, you know, I, th I think that the, 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 the main, the only real wisdom I have to impart, impart to people when they talk about writing habits and how to do it and things like that is, I think that um, consistency is the key. Right. And I think that, you know, you don't run a marathon after training for a week. You know, you have to do it every day, and then the marathon comes, and then it doesn't kill you because you're ready for it. So I think that um, it's important to activate that part of your mind every day so much as you can, so much as you have time to do it. And then I think the rest will fall into place or not fall into place, depending on your, uh, an individual's abilities and limitations. Um, beyond that, I think that the most important thing is, is to locate the writers who are writing for you, as opposed to the classics that you're supposed to read. Not that there's anything wrong with the classics that you're supposed to read. But you know, I think that um, clarify your intentions. It took me a really long time to clarify my intentions. Um, what I want to do. What kind of tone I want to hit. Um, there was years and years where I was just writing in, in the dark and just trying to be clever or trying to be deep and, you know, failing. Um, at a certain point, it's, it's, you know, it's much like we talked about easing into your skin. At a certain point, you ease into your skin as a writer, and it becomes second nature. And there's still failures aplenty, you know, and there will always be. But um, you know in a way you didn't know before. You know what I mean? Mm. Right, right. Yeah. Thanks so much. Sure. We have time for one last question, if anyone wants to spring up <coughs> and take the podium. Coming from the back. It's like a game show. Yeah, it's not a game show, but it could be. Um, okay, this is kind of a long question, but I'll make it short. Do you plot it or do you not plot your story? And if you don't, which I, because I, I think you don't, how do you, because you, you said that those two characters could have gone on and on and talked, right? Yeah. And you said I had to then edit it. Yeah. So how do you make sure it's their voice and not your voice? How, can you talk about that? Yeah. Well, when you say that, your voice, my voice, there's a one line in the book where Lucy's watching Clara crying beside a river. And um, there's this one, I won't be able to find it out, but there's this one line where I'll paraphrase. He basically says, um, a river's physical properties are secondary to its sound, mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with this book. Like the narrative, <laughs> like the, and, and suddenly the narrator has an opinion about rivers and why is this happening? And this is, of course, my opinion. <laughs> and and um, why is it in there for purely selfish reasons? I wanted that line to exist in the book. I remember expecting that it would be edited out, but nobody brought it up, so I just thought, okay. <laughs> Is it a joke, an in-joke with someone? No, I just, I, that's my feeling. When I'm near a river, you close your eyes, and the sound is more important to me than the way it looks. And I don't know what this means, uh, <laughs> but I prefer the sound of a river to the sight of a river. It sounds very authoritative. I feel like I'm book. not answering this yeah. man's question at all. But um, so 
the, the personal bleeds into the less personal or it bleeds into the you know, narrative which is meant to be theoretically personal but not overtly autobiographical. Um, the rest of it all in, in terms of like the, the, the conversations between Older Girl and Lucy, it's just a, an instinctive measuring out. Mm -hmm. And it's very much like any other sort of art or like cooking, you know, you know when to stop adding salt to this dish, hopefully, <laughs> you know. Or and, pepper in the case of Agnes the poor cook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But you know, it's 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 an, it's a, it's an instinctive and it's and it's attuned to one's own taste. So this is this is this is the taste that I was going for with this one. Thank you very much for that, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's amazing to have such an enormous crowd, and a testament to Patrick. Um, so thank you, guys. Thank you very much.